you didn't make any suggestion about magistrates being given some form of tenure. Uh, I'm hoping that this is not for purpose of this interview. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but, but <laughs> no, no, no. Judge, let me just go on. Yeah, okay. uh, so it was on the side. Okay. It wasn't meant for you. Uh, uh, and then the other, the other, in fact, is a misconception that there is a dichotomy between insiders and outsiders. Because this JSC, even if you pick the last batch of judges, the majority of those judges came from the bar and academia. So it's a false, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a and, false. And, and I'm glad and, to and hear even, that. Even amongst the magistrates, I mean, we tap magistrates from, from the bar. Yes. But that's where they come from. So uh, it's, it's a false narrative. But the word cartel came from you. Do you belong to a cartel? Um, I was uh, referring to um, uh, statements which have been made uh, by uh, members of the legal profession and also by the, by the former Chief Justice. I think he did mention that there are cartels. I read this deliberately. Yes. Are there people carrying Professor Makao Mutua to the Judicial <laughs> Service Commission? That's no. my last question. Uh, no, no, you. let me just say that um, uh, uh, First of all, uh, that uh, uh, the word cartel connotes uh, the mafia, uh, or some other insidious, insidious um, uh, uh, grouping. So I, I don't belong to any cartel, for sure. Uh, but I do think that there are interests outside the judiciary that seek to corrupt the judiciary and take advantage of the judiciary to subvert justice. And you know, independence, Independence is not just threatened by the executive. Exactly. Or by parliament. Or by the press. Or by the civil society. Yes. Yeah? Yes. No, the, no, the private so that's sector. Why, that's why, yeah. or private sector. The private that's why sector I'm asking you, that's why I'm asking you, mm. do you belong to a cartel? No, 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 no. Judge, I have never belonged to a cartel. Uh, the word is odious to me. Um, if you look at my life story, um, like I told you, I'm, a, I'm an open page, I'm an open book. So you can turn any page and you will not see any cartels. Thank you, Commissioner. Prof, you are continuing. Let me invite Winnie Nguchu. Professor. Yes, Winnie. Perceptions are very, very important. Yes. And the way people look at things, sometimes, whether true or not, they affect what people think and whatever. So I'm going to go back to that very tweet of yours. Yes. That you said that you're not going to recognize yes. Uhuru Kenyatta as president. If you become chief justice, yes. are we, is that a recipe for chaos? Because you're putting somebody who is the head of one arm of government to work, because you rightfully said that there will be collaboration, even mm. though the judiciary is independent. Yes. Are we creating, are we going to create chaos? Because there's this person who has no confidence in somebody else who's the head of mm. another arm of government. So the perception has been, how are, how are these two going to work together? Yes, yes. Um, I, I think, um, first of all, if you look at my life history, I, I have never created chaos. Um, uh, so this would be the first time that I would create chaos if, if that was to happen. Uh, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I am a responsible uh, professional. I have been uh, a distinguished academic for many years. I was a dean of a law school for seven years. Uh, I worked with very senior officials uh, in that capacity. Uh, I have complete fidelity to the law. Uh, I, I would say that um, that uh, if you look at the story of the Constitution, uh, and you and I were there in the very early days when no one believed that we could have a new Constitution. <coughs> if you look at my life story, that is my life story, fighting for those values. Uh, it does not mean, uh, Commissioner Gushu, that, uh, that um, you know, I don't dissent. 
and that I don't express divergent views about particular issues. Uh, as I said, even in families, you know, there are often some quite serious disagreements do take place. Uh, in a democracy, this is what is expected. Um, I have said often that um, my uh, making that statement was not personal to uh, 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 Mr. Kenyatta, was not personal. In fact, I think he's a wonderful guy. He's a very likable man, you know, very personable. Uh, it, is just, it was just about the circumstances of how um, he came to power at the time. And I, I was simply expressing myself at the time as a citizen. And I hope that uh, citizens can have the freedom to say those things, because there is nothing that is more important than the conscience of a citizen. You know, if, you know um, someone was asking me a similar question. He said, no, you have, you write a lot of columns and you uh, express views about public figures and so on. Um, that's very important for a democracy, that I'm able to speak like that. We fought for that right to speak like that. So why should we shrink from it? You know, and the same, the same freedom that the judges now have to rule without getting a phone call is the same freedom that I think with a conscience I can say to myself, I can make that statement, knowing that I'll be safe because I live in a democracy. But it does not mean that I, I, I would not uh, work with the president. It does not mean that at all. Yeah, it does not mean that at all. Good to get that assurance. Yes. And um, the other thing you spoke about, mm -hmm. you said that one of the roles of a chief justice is to provide a vision yes. for the institution. Yes. And, you know, so that citizens can be able to access justice yes. in a better way. Now, I want to ask you a very personal question. What is your vision? What is your vision for the judiciary if you became Chief Justice? So, so I think, uh, Commissioner Gushu, that's a very big question, but I, but I, I, I think I, I can sort of compress it a little bit. Um, let me say that um, I've said already that I like what has been happening in the judiciary. I want to associate myself with many of the changes that have taken place under Chief Justice Mutunga. And I say that without equivocation. Because when I look at the judiciary transformation framework, I find it compelling. I do. Um, so I think that's a baseline. That particular document is a baseline. I think that um, the second thing that I would like to see in the judiciary, I would like as a chief justice to provide intellectual leadership to the judiciary. And that means, in my view, that judges you know, and magistrates, uh, when matters come before them, as they rule and as they hear cases, that they simply not just apply the law as it is, they do that, of course, but they think about the consequences of particular interpretations of the law. And they think about the vision for the law that our Constitution provides. This Constitution uh, that we have uh, is one of the most progressive in the world. OK, there are some issues here and there, because it's a political document agreed upon by stakeholders. But it's just a wonderful document. There's not a way of putting it. If we as Kenyans took that document and as a judiciary implemented that document, even 50% of it, this would be a totally different country. You know, so, 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 so I just want to say to you that I, one, one, of the, one of my visions for the judiciary is for the judiciary to be the intellectual leader for the you know, interpretation of the Constitution, but that that must be done by all the judges, not just judges in the High Court or judges in the Court of Appeals or Supreme Court, even magistrates. Think about that document and implement it, because that document will give us what I have called in one of my articles a human rights state. 
a human rights There state. must be something that really motivated you to want to be a chief justice. Yes. What is that one thing that the day you walk out mm -hmm. from being chief justice, yes. we'll all be left talking about you? Yes. What is that one thing that you'll be identified with? My, <laughs> you, you are asking me to live in the future. Uh, it's difficult, difficult challenge. Um, I, I, I would like to be remembered if I become chief justice uh, as the person who restored public confidence in our judiciary so that no one would say that when I see our courts, I cannot get justice. So that no one will say, no matter who I am, whether I am the littlest and the lowest of the law, that I have no access to the courts. My vision is one in which we become, in effect, a temple of justice, in which citizens come to us you know, for redress uh, on virtually all social issues. And I say that because um, you know, I don't, I'm not thinking about monuments, uh, you know, constructing courtrooms and hiring judges. All that will be done. But I'm talking about uh, this intangible thing called public confidence. If, for example, you, you go to a court in the United States or you go to a court in the United Kingdom, you know, citizens actually believe that they can get justice. You know, if you slap a, a, an American kid, the first thing the kid will say is, I'll sue you. You know, so they, because, they, because they know that if they sue you, they will get justice. We want to get there so that our people can say they want justice. Uh, you know, Commissioner, and I'll, and I'll stop here, you know, Commissioner, uh, that um, one of the things that is very corrosive in our culture is corruption. It's been normalized. You go to, uh, to a public office uh, for a service that you should get, and people demand chai. Why is that? Why, can, why do we have to be that way? You know, that is what I think this judiciary can change. That corruption, which is now gone deeply into our bone marrows and is difficult to extract, that is what we should change. And no one else, the executive cannot change it because that is not the role of the executive really, quite frankly. Uh, the legislature cannot, cannot change it. You know. The judiciary is the one that must, must lead this fight against corruption, working the other arms of government. You know. that, that, this is the work of the judiciary, you know, and I'm very serious about this. And, and, and I, so I think that that is what I'd like to be, to be remembered for, that I'm the person who restored public confidence in, this, in our judiciary. Because you've talked about corruption as one of the things that is eroding the public confidence. I want you to tell us what tangible, what tangible things are you going to do to walk us through year one, year two, year three, yes. all the way to the end of your tenure. Yes. What practical steps are you going to put in place yes. to restore public confidence? Yes. And also to address also in terms of corruption. What tangible things are you going to do to yes. address corruption, yes. among other things, to bring back public yeah. confidence? Yeah. First of all, let me just say, uh, Commissioner Gushu, that I do not come as a messiah. Uh, you know, and so because my shoulders are not broad enough, uh, I just come as one of the colleagues. But you know, and but I would come as Chief Justice, clearly, and and so it would be incumbent upon me to give leadership and vision to the judiciary. But I do not come to tell people what to do. I come to lead men and women so that they together can find solutions to the problems that they face. Uh, I come to create a college of, of judges, and magistrates, judicial staff, a college well, from which we get, to, you know, we get the word collegiality. To think together, and so, 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 the, so, so in that respect, I think one of the things I will do, although I talked about the judicial transformation framework, 
as, as being good, I think we have to go back again and look at what the last five years have done or not done as a judiciary. Look at where the problems are. Clearly there's a question of the lack of confidence. Clearly there are some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say to call them pockets, but there are, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, unhappiness in the judiciary. Uh, you know, in my own experience as dean of a law school, there was nothing that was more important to me in doing my job than having the faculty talk to each other. It's nothing more important than that because that creates peer pressure. So for example, there's a question of backlog of cases. You know, and there are some judges uh, you know, who perhaps are carrying twice the workload of other judges. I think I've, I, I have heard that. Why is that the case? You know, how can that picture, you know, uh, how can we introduce equity in the kind of workload that, that, that our judicial officers carry? Um, how do we assess the performance of staff within the judiciary? What happens when someone loses a file? Do they just get a slap on the wrist? Or does something serious happen? You know, so, so I think we, we, we will need to, to, to introduce uh, you know, more systems. Um, I, I know that there is a project uh, uh, within JPIP uh, you know, through which magistrates, you know, uh, can see what the others are doing. That's important, and that should be continued. Uh, but it, it is important that it, it is done in such a way that it does not shame, uh, you know, colleagues. Okay. Now, I'm sure you listen to a lot of people. I want you to tell us what do people say about Macau Mutua. The good things and the bad things. Oh my goodness. How those good things will translate yes. into making a good chief justice and the weaknesses or challenges that they may put across. Yes. How you're going to address them yes. so that you fit into this position. Well, you are a tough interviewer, but um, <laughs> very tough. Um, uh, I think that um, I, I have a reputation as uh, I work holic. I work hard. Um, wh when I begin a task, I finish it, and I make sure that it is done the right way. And I'm also my own toughest critic. Uh, probably after I finish the interview, I'll go back saying, man, well, you know, he, you didn't do well, you know. In my own books, I never do well. I'm always trying to reach for the next, for the next level. Uh, and I try to infuse that into, into people I work with. I'm a people person. Um, I um, believe deeply that in a work environment, your people are your biggest resource. And if you cannot inspire the people you work with, if they do not, they do not feel like they should come to you, even with their personal issues, then you are not doing what you're supposed to do. Um, I, um, I believe in consultation and deliberation. Uh, even if I would disagree with what you say, I would defend to the death your right to say it in a collegial setting. Because I believe that the best solutions come from the most rigorous conversations and disagreements. That is what I would seek to build as Chief Justice, a judiciary where people can express themselves without fear of retaliation. Um, I, um, I value diversity and difference, deeply value diversity and difference. Um, uh, you, you know, you will never, 
Uh, and I've never been accused of being a person who uh, is biased uh, on uh, any of the classifications that we think of as bias, race, gender, ethnicity, and so on and so forth, or even sexuality, never. And I worked very hard at it. Um, I, um, in terms of weaknesses, um, some of your strengths could also be your weaknesses. You know, the sword can be turned the other way. You know, um, I think that um, that uh, I have a proclivity for moving fast, thinking through issues, solving them, and moving. Okay. I'm just being candid, and, and, and often some people say, well, you know, you might, if you do that, you might leave people, some, some people behind. It is something I've learned over time, it's something I must watch out for, that when I move with things in a group, that we must make sure that everyone is on board. So patience is important. You know, I cancel my own patience. Um, uh, uh, some people have said that um, I express myself too robustly. That sometimes I should not speak the way I speak. But, you know, I've said uh, that it is better for you to know what's in my mind than not to know what is there. Although I must say that, that when, when people say that, they, they, sometimes they think, oh, perhaps this guy uh, you know, thinks he knows, he knows best. No, no, that's a reputation that is not justified. I simply say what I believe, you know, and, and then people, some people think, well, you know, he thinks he knows best. Um, uh, I think I've heard the word arrogance, uh, you know, mentioned. You know, uh, people often say that when they spend time with me, they say, well, I thought that uh, you're such an arrogant fellow. How come you're so, you know, down to earth? You know, for some reason, there, there's an image out there that uh, is a false narrative. And I think it just comes from the way I express myself sometimes. Uh, but I think it's completely false. Um, and, um, and I mean, you have letters of recommendation from people I've worked with for many years. Uh, um, they will attest to this. There are many Kenyans who know me, including some of you know me personally. Um, uh, this is not, this is the furthest thing from, from who I am. Uh, but I think that narrative is out there. But I just want to assure the JSC and Kenyans that uh, it's a false narrative. Question, and um, I'll give you privilege of five minutes to make you Chief Justice, just for five minutes for purposes of answering this question. Mm, and just tell us, you're now Chief Justice. Mm. Your first week at work, mm. what are you doing? My first week at work. So, um, I am appointed Chief Justice. It's um, an awesome responsibility. You are leading one of the three arms of government. Kenyans are watching with bated breath to see what you're going to do. The judiciary, uh, all the judges and magistrates are uh, on tender hooks because a new leader is always, you know, people don't know what's gonna happen, you know. Um, so that's, that is the context in which you, I, I would find myself. I think the first thing that I would do, quite frankly, is to listen to people. Um, not speak. It is just to go from office to office and listen to people do retail, retail uh, consultation, one-on-one. -on -one. And approach 
the different constitu constituencies of the judiciary, not just the judges, but approach everyone. I want to find out from people what they really think about their judiciary, what they think has gone right, and what they think has gone wrong. Um, this listening tour is indispensable. So that is the first thing, listening to people in the judiciary in the first week. Um, and then after I listen to people in little groups or just in ones or twos, I will then begin to think about bigger groupings so that we can begin to have a, uh, you know, a system-wide conversation about where we need to go. That's number one. The second thing that I would do uh, is to uh, begin conversations with the other arms of government in the first week. I would visit the executive and have, you know, good faith, candid conversations because I would want to set the table at the beginning of my tenure for the kind of relationship that I would have with the head of state and the executive arm. It's very important. The judiciary is, uh, you know, one of the most important arms of government, but the judiciary does not control uh, the most resources within a state. It doesn't. We need the executive to be able to, to move. So have conversations to establish you know, ground rules and areas of collaboration, areas of concern. I on those out. The same with the, with, the, with, with, the, with the legislature. Do the same thing. Uh, this is an inward, this is, so the first one is inward looking. The other one is now outward looking. And then I think uh, the last thing that I would do um, is to meet Kenyans in their places is to go to locales out there in Isiolo, in Muranga, in Megori and so on, in Kisi, and speak to Kenyans. Because after all, they are the ones who give us the judicial power. That will be my first uh, one or two weeks. Mm. Share with us your thoughts about the Supreme Court, mm. given that it is a new court, actually. Chief Justice Mutunga was its first president. Mm. These are your views about it. It's the Apex Court. It is a very, very important court in the structure of the institution of the judiciary. Yes, um, <coughs> thank you, um, Ms. Ominde. Um, <coughs> uh, the Supreme Court of Kenya is a singular institution in the structure of our judiciary. Um, <clears throat> it is the court that has the final say um, on anything concerning the constitution of this republic. Um, and as we know, our new constitution provides for the supremacy of the people in the republic. Uh, through that provision, the constitution is now given the authority to interpret this document. Um, so I cannot think of any other institution within the state, including even the presidency, that has as much power over the Constitution as the Supreme Court. This is an awesome responsibility. Um, it's almost like a sacred duty to sit on that court. 
uh, the men and women who are um, uh, privileged to sit on that court um, are required to have the capacity, the compassion, the intellect, and the moral and ethical values and standards to measure up to the challenges of being the individuals who are the final say on the country's most important institution and document. It means that the Supreme Court must comport itself in such a way that it leaves no doubt. Because the Supreme Court is, in a sense, the country's largest brain, if I can use that expression. In terms of understanding the Constitution, the country's largest brain. Uh, it means that the, 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 the men and women there must exhibit uh, these, these qualities. Now, <clears throat> uh, new ins institutions in, in, in the structure of our constitution <clears throat> uh, have been having growth pains. You know, the IABC, you know, just name them, all of them. And, and that is to be expected. That is the nature of evolution of a new constitutional order. Um, and so I, one understands that the court will take time to find its traction. You know, older courts in established democracies uh, in the West took 50, 100 years uh, to become established, uh, to develop traditions of judging and of their place in the structure of the state. Um, five years is a very short time for any institution to establish these traditions, uh, you know, and rhythms of the everyday. Um, it is a difficult challenge. Um, layer on top of that the fact that our country is driven by, uh, it's a great country, first of all, let me just <laughs> acknowledge this, but it's driven by some, um, by some demons. Ethnicity is one of them. Corruption is another. And professionalism is another. We have any number of problems, what I call demons, that we need to deal with. Uh, these demons, the societal demons, affect all of us and affect all our ins institutions. And the Supreme Court is not exempt from them. It means that for a young institution in a young democracy, with all these challenges, it's tough. It is tough because these are human beings. Um, uh, we have seen, and the public of Kenya has seen, uh, you know, the Supreme Court um, uh, 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 issues on display. This is not something that is a secret, right? We have seen uh, judges suing other judges. The, I, I guess they, they also have rights to sue. Uh, we have seen um, other questions that uh, raise issues and so on. Um, and so I would say that, that, the, that the public is looking at all these things from the outside, including myself, I'm part of the public, looking at them from the outside and getting worried Uh, so, 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 just to finish, I mean, I just want to say that uh, that I think, I think that one of the things that should uh, the next chief justice will have to do, it's an awesome task, as I said, difficult task, is to 
we introduce collegiality on that court. I, I, um, I don't want to miss my words. There has to be collegiality. Uh, Supreme Court judges must respect each other. Uh, I'm reminded, uh, by the way, uh, of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, uh, the one that was established uh, in 1994 after apartheid. Do you know, that, uh, Ms. Omenda, that that court brought together the most divergent individuals? There were some individuals there who came from the apartheid era who were beneficiaries of that terrible system. There were individuals who had fought for civil rights, like, you know, um, uh, Mr. Ch Arthur Chaskerson, who became, you know, the Chief Justice. And then you had, uh, for the first time, a black woman sitting there, Ivan Mohoro, on that court. So you pr it brought together people from divergent v uh, uh, walks of life. But do you know something? That court was so um, uh, uh, productive and forward-looking in initial jurisprudence that it, this can be done. You know, um, just one more thing. Um, in the U.S. Supreme Court, I just want to give one example from the U.S. Supreme Court. Two of the judges who sat at opposite ends of the ideological spectrum you could not find any two judges who are more opposed to each other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, the late Antonin Scalia. In fact, I don't know whether there were rulings that, uh, that where they ever concurred, but they were the best of friends, they were traveling, bu traveling buddies, they had social dinners together, so it can be done. You can disagree illogically and jurisprudentially, but still be colleagues. So I think I think that these are some of the challenges that I think the, 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 the Chief Justice will have, to, will have to handle, and I don't think we do ourselves any favors by sweeping them under the carpet. Actually, by virtue of the fact that it can be done is why I want you to tell us how you propose to do it. Yes. Because you have actually acknowledged <coughs> that uh, there is a problem you have given us examples where um, people <coughs> from very different backgrounds have come together and worked very well. Yes. In fact, in the judiciary, like you rightly pointed out, there has been exponential growth amongst judicial staff, <coughs> excuse me, uh, within the magistracy, within the high court. In fact, new courts have already been established in terms of the environment and land court, in terms of the labor relations court, and even the court of appeal has been expanded, mm -hmm. and indeed um, decentralized. But we don't see um, the problem of cohesion amongst these courts, where you can say that there's been the old and the new being put together mm -hmm. to work together for the good of the people mm -hmm. as in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And you have talked about the demons that uh, bedevil us when we try to build a cohesive society. Would you say this demon is quite active in the Supreme Court as opposed to other courts? And what magic do you have to exercise it yes. so that even this court can be regarded like all those other Supreme Courts that you have mentioned. Yes. First of all, let me acknowledge um, uh, to you and the Judicial Service Commission that, in fact, other branches, um, other divisions of, of the judiciary are doing quite well in the High Court, in the Court of Appeal, in the Magistracy. Um, I mean, the, kind of po the kinds of issues that I think we see in the Supreme Court, uh, you know, they might be there in those other courts, but they are not as uh, severe. Uh, so when Kenyans say that there's a problem with the judiciary, uh, they are actually looking primarily at the Supreme Court uh, as a problem. They are not looking at 
everything else underneath, because everything else underneath, you know, is transforming, is working, it, it's moving ahead. But then they see the apex court and they despair. Um, I don't think there's a magic wand that one can wave to just um, shoo away the demons. Even Kamuti will not work. Um, I think it's a hard slog. I think it's building relationships uh, with the leadership of the Chief Justice. It's creating spaces, both professional and social, where the members of the court can actually interact with each other uh, in a way that's productive. Um, I, uh, when, when, when I became dean uh, uh, at SUNY, um, one of the things that I did initially was to invite, uh, was to have a series of dinners at my house with uh, members of the faculty, members of the staff, just create spaces for people to talk. And people who had not talked for a long time began to talk. We cannot underestimate the value of retail politics, as I call it. You know, finding these spaces because because human beings um, are very prickly. They're very prickly, and you need to treat them as as, as such. You know, they, they, you know, so so I think I, I think well I say I'm saying there's no magic wand, but I'm saying that 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 there can be social spaces, there can be professional spaces where people interact, but I think the Chief Justice has to take leadership of that, of that bench. And, and, and I say that uh, knowing that it is difficult to do so, knowing that it, is, it will take a long time to accomplish, but it must be done. Uh, there, there are also ways of resolving some problems internally. Uh, again, with the Chief Justice taking some, some leadership. Um, because some of the problems that uh, we've seen there, uh, you know, perhaps could have been resolved internally so that the public does not have to be, to be brought into the, into the picture, uh, you know, which will then have this, this adverse effect of, of uh, affecting the, 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 the prestige of the court. So, 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 so I say that, but I also, let me also say this. Uh, the Supreme Court does not exist by itself. There is a Court of Appeal, there is the High Court, okay? And I say that those courts are, are working well. Uh, perhaps there are some things that the Supreme Court can learn from those other courts and why they are working so well, you know? Um, I don't know whether an opportunity exists um, I could be educated uh, about this, where all these courts come together, and I'm not talking about the colloquium, the judicial colloquium now that you have annually, but, but something that is constant, you know, and regular, where, you know, people can intermarry views uh, between, between the courts to create really a college, what I call a college of judicial officers who think together who work together, who struggle together for a better judiciary, you know. In the, at the end of the day, uh, if the Supreme Court is not uh, rescued, as I said, from, you know, the malaise that it finds itself in, Kenyans will lose hope in the Supreme Court. And we know that it has the awesome and difficult responsibility of deciding presidential petitions. Now, what kind of, where would Kenyans go for those petitions if they have no confidence in that court? It is very, very difficult. So let me just say this, uh, just to finish this, this thought, that, um, uh, that, that, that it is essential that, uh, that we restore uh, the prestige. Otherwise, Kenyans will be calling for either a reconstitution or, or a disbanding of the Supreme Court. I've, I've seen this. Uh, written already somewhere, and I've seen people talk about it. That's very worrying. It's very worrying. 
thank you very much, uh, Professor. And you already handled in uh, responding to issues raised by my colleagues. But uh, just one more issue. The judiciary has been um, not really accused, but um, in various fora, uh, it has been acknowledged that a lot of good is going on in the judiciary. There is, however, a problem of communicating it out there mm -hmm. so that people get to know and we also invite views that could help us mm. do much better. Yes. Um, the judicial workforce, like you said, the most important resource you can have in any institution, it's its human resource. More often than not, when, like you said, uh, when, you came in, when you come in, you're week one, everybody's anxious, there's a new chief justice, how does he think, uh, what is important to him, how does he regard this and that and that. My concern then, because people look to you and they want to know who the new chief justice is. You must have a communication strategy for the internal publics as well as the external ones. Um, you said that every individual has many faces. There's the citizen Ominde, magistrate Ominde, and many others. Now, how will that help you in communicating to the internal publics particularly who you must lead towards a common goal and towards a common vision. Mm. If they are not able to know mm. which of the faces of the Chief Justice am I dealing with at any point in time? Mm. Yes, um, I, I, uh, the Chief Justice um, position uh, is a complex, complex one. Uh, the Chief Justice must be a friend, in my view now, this is my vision, must be a friend to judges and to magistrates and to, and to, and to judicial staff. Uh, and this friendship must be demonstrated uh, through listening, through talking to people, uh, you know, through involving people in participating in the recreation of their institution. Uh, so, the, this, this, um, so the chief justice cannot be someone who is uh, aloof, must be a friend. When I pass you in the corridors, I might say good morning. Okay. They are parts of African culture that, are, that we've forgotten, that are very useful. How's your family? You know, we've forgotten all these things. Sometimes that means a whole lot to people. Just ask them, how is your family? You know, so, so that aspect has to be there. I think that um, uh, the Chief Justice must also become an ambassador. Um, for the judiciary within it, but also deputize other members of the judiciary and this commission as ambassadors for the judiciary. This means that the, the business of communicating the vision of the judiciary that's agreed upon becomes the responsibility of everyone. It is not just the Chief Justice communicating his, his vision. And by communication, I don't mean issuing press releases or sending emails. I mean actual human contact. So people can ask questions about this or that. So being an ambassador is critical in my view. Uh, then I think, uh, the other face of the Chief Justice that has to be there um, is that of leading by example. What we call, 
in academia, the demonstration effect. You must demonstrate to the people in the judiciary uh, that these values that you hold dear are the values that, that you live. Um, you know, so, so, so I, I, I'm just trying to talk about the complexity of, of the job and the many faces, because I don't think, I'm not talking about a multiple personality disorder, just to be clear, okay? But I'm talking about the many faces of, of a person's life. I mean, uh, you know, Professor Kobia is a mother, she's the chair of the, of the uh, BSC, she's, she's, you know, she's many things, you know? And in each role, she, she does different things. So uh, that is not a disorder, that is just a complexity of life. Thank you. I'd say the, the last one, but let me ask the last question. Uh, let's talk about the external publics. And we are all agreed that there's the reality, then there's the perception. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Muchelule asked you about the possibility that any cartel may have carried uh, uh, Professor Macau and brought him to this uh, mm. chair, mm. Uh, wanting that he becomes Chief Justice. Mm. Now, there's this perception that the judiciary needs to be led by an individual who is able, and I'm saying it's a perception, to tell off government, to tell off parliament, of course, then when you look at the, um, the principle of judicial independence, you realize it's not a matter of telling off, it's how we can work together so that each retains its uh, independence. And we read the papers, we are on social media, and uh, you have been touted as the candidate who is required if the judiciary is to maintain its independence in terms of telling off. Mm. Now, you have told us, you know, that Professor Macau, who seemed to have been expressing himself so robustly, was just the citizen. And that the Chief Justice, Professor Mutua, will be a totally different kettle of fish. Now, do you think you could have disappointed the fans out there, <laughs> by that statement. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, first of all, I, I cannot control what people, uh, <coughs> you know, tweet uh, on social media. Uh, people are free to do so. That's part of the freedom that we enjoy. Um, I'm obviously pleased that uh, some people think that I would make a good Chief Justice. So I welcome those views and say that they should be, you know, amplified. Um, uh, I think uh, you know, clearly the Chief Justice must have confidence of the people behind him. Uh, I cannot tell you how important that is. When the JSC decides who becomes Chief Justice, I'm sure that you will pick someone who enjoys public confidence. Uh, I think there are always people angling for for uh, relevance, uh, uh, I, you know, and I think, uh, you know, like I said, people say things that they will say, and that's their business. I have, can't control them. All I can say is that um, I have a, I've devoted my entire life to the struggle for a decent society. That's why I was expelled from this country. Uh, I lived in exile at a very young age. Left my family here. I was torn away when I was in my early 20s. You don't want to wish that on any child. I became a refugee. Um, I uh, have benefited from the grace of good Samaritans. I've been lucky. I took every opportunity that I was given to become who I have become today. Um, I have no godfathers. 
my mother, who is uh, gone, remains my model, a simple woman from Kitui, who raised and fed me and taught me what is right from what is wrong. I don't compromise on decency and ethics and values. I've never done it. I don't take orders from anyone. And I'm not going to begin at the age of 58. Um, I don't need to take orders from anyone to do what I need to do. Um, so, but I also want to say to you that this narrative that <clears throat> I'll be telling of government is a mischaracterization of, of what my role in society has been. I'm a social critic. And that also comes with the territory of being a human rights academic and a human rights advocate. The two go together. If you look at the things that I have said in my role as, a, as an academic or as a social critic, you will see that they are all grounded in some human rights value. Now, we might disagree, you know, whether, you know, it, it, it should have been said or not said, but it's grounded. Because every time I lift my pen and write something that's going to go public, I think about it. And, you know, um, uh, if anyone out there thinks that uh, I can be purposed as a CJ, they are sadly mistaken. Thank you very much uh, for that assurance, Professor Macau, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. I think we are moving on well, and uh, we still have about three or four commissioners who need to raise their questions. Let me guide on being very specific with the questions, and Professor, because now of time, can we also be very direct in answering the question? Yes. I think I we have we are actually almost making you repeat some of the things. So let's just go more direct responses. Mm -hmm. I think it will help all of us. Uh, Isn't that part of the Chief Justice's job is to, to, to be able to take, all, to take difficult questions and uh, not sure, get tired? Sh sure, <laughs> I, I, you shouldn't get tired. And I think uh, that's why we are giving you this opportunity yes. and pushing you hard to sh see that you can uh, do it. Let me invite Commissioner Masindeche. Um, uh, Come on, Professor. Marhaba. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll ask you a few it's questions. There's a difference in age that big. I, uh, I'm still thinking it's of myself as a young man. I think uh, of myself as a young man, but uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, I, I want to revisit briefly mm. uh, the issue of help. I confirm that uh, you, you actually have a, a, a clearance certificate from help. And, uh, but I also noticed that you paid up uh, the boom, the loan, in mm -hmm. July 2016. Yes. That is over three decades after you, since you enjoyed uh, the facility. Yes. And my question then is, did you know that you were under an obligation to mm. pay? Mm. That is the first arm of the question. Mm. And if you did, why did you not pay? Mm. And I'm also wondering, are we dealing with a situation of but for? But for this interview, you are not going to pay. Mm. And uh, lastly, mm. what would that, uh, someone say that uh, integrity is doing something when no one is watching mm. and when no one will hold you to account? Yes. So what would that say about integrity? No, it's a very good question, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Deche. Um, so um, I went to the University of Nairobi from 79 to 81. Um, we used to, uh, uh, in those days, uh, uh, Justice Mucherule, who is my age mate, <laughs> I hope he won't deny it either that he's my age mate. Uh, you know, I, 
we just used to go and uh, we would actually go to the, um, I can't remember what office we used to go to, but we would simply sign uh, something, a piece of paper, and be given a couple of um, hundred or thousand shillings um, and, go, and go away, and we used to call it boom. Um, the thought never crossed my mind that it was a loan uh, at all. Um, then I was expelled from the University of Nairobi and left the country for over 10 years. Um, I have never received a letter from anyone telling me that I owe anything uh, from uh, the, high, the higher loans, uh, education loans board. Never. Uh, so, in fact, when I saw the requirement that uh, I should get a clearance certificate from, uh, from HELP, I was like, but I never took a loan from anyone. Why, why is this relevant? Yeah. I mean, so I was very perplexed by it. Then I wrote to them, you know, thinking that uh, the next minute I'll get an email saying, here, you are cleared. Well, the next minute they faxed me, or they actually emailed me um, a sheet, which I can share with the commission if you want it, uh, with uh, my name and the day, dates on which I signed and the monies that I got. But that document that they emailed to me uh, does not indicate that it was a loan. I looked at all the fine print in it, nothing. So I was so shocked, um, I immediately uh, called my brother and uh, I sent him and I said, you know, I go pay up. We can't have this. So it was paid up. Um, uh, quite frankly, I, I, I was thinking that I'm going to, I was going to ask them if it was a loan. Because I'm, I still am not quite sure it was a loan. But I, but, I, but I didn't want to argue too much because I needed the clearance. You know, so the fact of the matter is that uh, no, uh, it was not something I was doing because people were watching or because I needed the clearance. Um, you know, one forty thousand shillings that was required is something I would have paid if someone had brought it to my attention. No one has. Uh, I have a relationship uh, with the University of Nairobi because I went there. They have never come to me to ask for uh, a contribution for anything. Uh, so I just think that they are bad systems, quite frankly, and, uh, and don't, don't, do, don't do follow up. If they had done follow up, I would have paid up and there would, be, would have been no issue. So I can say with a clear conscience that um, there are no implications in my mind about uh, this particular issue. Uh, which then brings me to my, my next question, Professor. Mm. Uh, you did not know it was alone and it's okay, I'll take that. Yes. But uh, even when you were answering a question from uh, Commissioner Muchelule, mm. you, you had difficulty remembering pay. You, you said, I don't know what it's called, uh, pay as you earn. Mm. Uh, you also did not know that you need an ID uh, to get um, uh, clearance from the, from the CID, uh, mm. from, the, from the relevant uh, agency. Mm -hmm. You also talked of uh, an expired ID, mm. and uh, I was wondering, would that be a reflection of um, the extent to which you are out of touch with what I would call the obvious, basic Kenyan reality? And mm. if so, then what would that be hope for the nation mm. if we get such a, a CJ? Yes. No, thank you uh, for that question. I. Um, First of all, let me just say that um, uh, uh, you know, the life of an exile is a difficult one, especially at a very young age. It's very difficult. You do not know when you are, I was exiled at the age of 21. You do not know where your next meal is gonna come from. You live by the grace of strangers. You try to make do in the country where you find yourself. It is very, very difficult. 
The person that you see sitting here today in front of you is not a person who was in exile early in his life. Okay? Um, you, you do what is necessary uh, to actually put soul and body together in those circumstances. The one thing I had was my passport. Uh, I had an expired ID. My, my, my ID expired while I was in exile. Uh, it is true that I come here often, but the occasion for the ID to be required has never presented itself. So I just never got it. I could, I'm just being honest with you, I could, I could get things with my passport if I needed to do to do that. It's just, a, it's just a, a, an ID. A passport is an ID. So, Professor, so that if maybe I could uh, guide the, the, the line of questioning that uh, I had in mind. Yes. M my main uh, question is, mm. do you think you are to a certain extent out of sync no, no, ask, with oh, the yeah. Kenyan reality? And I'm very sorry about your exile situation. No, no, no. I was coming to that, Commissioner. I was coming to that question because I was just trying to give you the, 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 the sort of the, the, the lay of the, of the ground. Uh, no, I don't think so at all. Um, I am very grounded in this country. Um, the fact that I don't have a, an active ID, um, to me, doesn't speak to the question as to whether I am grounded. Uh, I am, I have, I have, uh, uh, you know, I have very strong contacts here, both personal, family, and professional. Um, I am very grounded. Um, in terms of the place where I, I grew, I grew up. Um, uh, you know, so I think the question, uh, I understand the question, but, uh, but I, I would say uh, respectfully, uh, Commissioner Deche, that uh, no, not at all. Uh, when I walk the streets of this uh, country, or I walk the rural areas of this country, I feel at one with the soil. Uh, thank you, Professor. Now that you brought the issue of contacts, uh, in your letter of 1st July uh, to the Secretariat, you needed help in getting the names, addresses, and email contacts of the bodies where you needed to get, uh, you were required to get clearances from. Yes. And I'm talking about bodies like the Law Society of Kenya, yes. the help itself. Yes. Would you still say that you have the relevant contacts? Yeah, I do. In fact, um, in fact, when I was here, um, in, in, was, it, was it in May, for the, for the Warren Bank mission on JPIP, I met with the Law Society. I went to their offices. I met with the president. I met with uh, uh, Ms. Wambu and so on. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, what I was trying to do in that letter, I was trying to indicate to the registrar that since I was out of the country, it would be difficult for me to procure, I'll use that word, Professor Muigai, to procure, <laughs> I, think, I think this is the appropriate time to use it, <laughs> to procure uh, the clearances. Um, and so it was so it was in terms of signaling to her that there is this difficulty because i it, it may not come as quickly i'll just put in her on notice that this was happening okay. let me move on to the next question um your cv of course is very impressive both in academia research and consultancy but um you are very many things world renowned on human rights and all that, but there are other things that you are not, that I just want us to address uh, yes. uh, for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I'll be picking up from what the AG was talking about. Mm -hmm. the, because there are certain milestones that you skipped in your, in your career. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about milestones which, however mundane they may appear to be, like uh, you have never attended court Either, definitely, you are not a judicial officer. You, have, you never attended the Kenyan courts as a pupil for, clinical, for the clinical program, not an advocate, whether practicing in the lower court or the high court or court of appeal or Supreme Court. 
And uh, I am thinking, if you become the CJ, one of the, probably maybe the one, one brief that you will have to handle, it might be the first one, mm. is the presidential election. Mm. And I am thinking, here we have someone who is engaging um, the, the judicial system for the first time. That might be the first time when you're sitting in court, uh, in an arbitrating of our matter. What do you think would be the challenges of having a CJ? And remember, the, an, a presidential election petition is normally, uh, I would say it's one of the most important cases that we have uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be the challenges of having uh, the president of the Supreme Court who is engaging the court process mm -hmm. for the first time in a presidential uh, election petition? Yeah, first of all, uh, let me just say that I've, I, have, I have been in court in other jurisdictions, so, uh, Yes, I know that. That's why I specifically yes, said yes. Kenyan courts. Yes, yes. And I also, um, I'm not argue, trying to argue with you, but I'm saying that um, there are um, former judicial uh, judges in, in this country who had never practiced in Kenya, but became judges in Kenya. Um, I can think of a few, but uh, let me just say that, uh, so uh, not to argue with you, the, the point is well taken. Um, uh, it is simply that um, the, the Supreme Court, um, first of all, uh, is not a trial court in the basic sense of the word. Um, it's a court uh, that, um, uh, in my view, uh, adjudicates very weighty matters of the Constitution. Um, what is required in my view in that court uh, is not so much, uh, 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 it's important, but, but it is not fatal if you don't have it. It is not a long history uh, on the Kenyan bench. Uh, I think what's required is a very uh, uh, good mind, good legal mind, What's required is uh, an ethical individual. Uh, what's required is a leader because the chief justice is just one of seven judges. You know, he is not the whole court. What's required is a person who can lead those other six men and women to think through these difficult issues. Um, uh, so, I, I, I mean, I, uh, quite frankly, uh, I have thought about your question even before you asked it. And I, 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 uh, I don't want to minimize the importance of the question, but I think I would be equal to the task. I think I would. Okay, I will leave the issue as to whether the Supreme Court is a trial court to Commissioner Warsame. Let me move on to the next uh, question. In your article, your, your, the article you, you referred to uh, on the state of the judiciary, in, I think that was in 2001? Yes, the uh, 2001. Quarterly, yeah. Yes, and uh, in it, you seem to place the problems on fighting the, the, the challenges we have had in fighting col corruption mm at the feet of the judiciary, because this is what you've said. Mm. Uh, you are specifically dealing with the Goldenberg scandal, and you say the Goldenberg scandal has shown uh, the complete inability of the Kenyan courts to effectively and fairly adjudicate or try any matter mm. in which senior officials of the government are uh, in jeopardy. That, that was on page 116. Mm. Uh, I believe we still do have challenges we, in our courts in fighting uh, the high-level corruption. As CJ, what you do put in place mm. 
uh, in order to move us away from that position which was there in mm. 2001, yes. when we were writing the article and we are pretty much uh, still not out of the woods yet. Yes. And do you think the anti-corruption -cor courts which we have in place uh, currently yes. uh, serve the purpose or what would you do differently? Yes. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner, uh, let me just say this. Uh, first of all, I, I've said what a deplorable condition our judiciary was in those days. And I think I, um, it is not to paint with a broad brush every judge who was then sitting. But I think it's a fairly accepted uh, wisdom that there were many problems of the inability to fight corruption within the judiciary. Uh, reports uh, by, uh, commissioned by the, the judiciary itself confirmed these inabilities. Uh, there was also, um, uh, I think, a proclivity for the courts to, to, to let off uh, culpable individuals uh, on technicalities. And I think that was deliberate. I think it was the name of the game. When you have judges on contract who can be dismissed at will, what do you expect? How can they deal with the big fish, so to speak? So it was a sad situation. Um, and judges, I think, felt constrained to, to stick their neck out, to be the ones who would rule in a particular way against a particular big fish. The Chinese have a saying that it is the peacock that raises its head that gets shot. Um, I say this just to say this, uh, uh, Commissioner Deshya, that, uh, um, that there was complicity by some in the judiciary. Yes, Professor, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I, I have read the article and you have put all that. Yes. But I want you to tell us now, as a CJ going forward, how yes. would we move out of that? Yes. So first of all, I, I was going to come to that. Um, you know, first of all, let me just say that uh, I think that judges have to be empowered to feel that they can issue judgments without consequence to themselves. They have to be freed as judges so that they can rule according to the law. That's very important. That is the meaning of judicial independence. The Chief Justice does not dictate to a judge what a judge is going to rule, uh, nor does the JAC dictate that. As long as a judge is following their conscience and is showing fidelity to the law, you know, they, are, they, 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 they should be able to be free to do that. That's one thing that I think should happen. And I must say that that is, that is already happening, uh, you know, under the, under the, uh, the, the this regime of, of, of Chief Justice Mutunga that just ended. That judges can just give judgments, and they know that the Chief Justice will protect them. That's very important, number one, especially in corruption cases. So I would make it very clear to judges that they are free to do so, to follow the law, and to follow it to wherever it leads. That's very important. The second thing I think uh, that's important is that um, I think that um, uh, investigating agencies in this country, uh, security agencies in this country, uh, have no backbone to fight corruption. In fact, many of those agencies that are supposed to fight corruption are themselves corrupt. As we've seen, I mean, it's, 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 it's public knowledge. So when you have a police force that is compromised, you have an anti-corruption commission that is compromised, you have a CID that is compromised, those are the, those are the agencies that are supposed to bring you uh, evidence. Because if you don't give me evidence as a judge, I cannot convict. So one of the things that I would do, uh, and I think here the Attorney General would be very useful, is to work with the Attorney General uh, and the ex executive arm of government to gain the cooperation of those agencies so that they can give us the evidence that we need to prosecute individuals who are corrupt. So this, 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 this idea of uh, 
interdependence between the arms of government is very important because, because the judiciary doesn't have investigators. You know, so, so, so those are the things that I would do. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, your role model was your mother. Thank you. Now, in your article on savages, victims, and saviors, the yes. metaphor, the interesting metaphor that uh, you discussed. Yes. When it comes to human rights of women, mm. who is the savage? Because you said uh, the savage is not always the the state. You are saying the savage is on one side, yes. and then the victim and uh, and the. Um, the savior on the other. Yes. When it comes, because we are having a situation in Kenya where the realization of the, the, the rights of um, women is not, uh, it's not going to, according to me, I, I know you, right. you really love that equal and you can go into detail, yeah, but I want you to, to yes. just tell us yes. with regard to the human rights of women, yeah, that's who the, is the savage, just that. Maybe yes, we can engage later on on the details okay, fine, of the, fine, 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 yes. fine. Uh, I'll spit it out. Uh, so this is what it is. The savage uh, in this particular uh, situation, there are, there are several savages. Clearly the state is a savage, in my view. Uh, uh, maybe the AG doesn't want me to say that, but uh, the state is, <laughs> is, a, is a savage because the state has not done what it is supposed to do to secure the rights of women. In the, in the, in the Universal Periodic Review report that the AG has written, the implementation matrix, 2016, I think, to 2019, the AG acknowledges that the state has many steps to, to go. So the state is one savage. The second savage, I would say, is the male gender. You know, the patriarchs, you know, who control this country and who act like misogynists. You know, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. You know, we men have not done uh, uh, the right thing um, uh, where the rights of women are concerned. Uh, this is in, in private, in the private sphere now, not the public square. It, because our constitution, as you know, is also horizontal, not just vertical. Uh, so that's, another, th that's a problem there. And then I think there is, quite frankly, aspects of culture. And I'm not just talking about African culture here. I'm talking about all culture. As, 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 a, as, a, as a rubric, including uh, the culture of pornography, you know, which, 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 which demeans women, and, and that is imported from other societies, including, um, you know, some of our traditions as Africans that I think are problematic. Um, so I think you have that. And then finally, and this may, may, may sound strange, the human rights corpus itself is not exactly wouldn't go scot-free because it has not done what it is supposed to do either. If you look at CEDO, uh, the convention, there are some issues there that you can think about. Uh, but also, you look at, you look at uh, the, the, the platform from Beijing. I mean, it was a good platform. Has it been translated by the human rights movement? Not really. Thank you, Professor, for identifying the savages uh, <laughs> against <laughs> the, the cause for uh, women ri women's rights. Now, uh, maybe zeroing it in a little bit more, mm -hmm. when it comes to the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court, uh, especially the, the issue of the two-thirds, and thereafter even the, the attempts at um, realizing it, the, that constitutional principle, who really then has been the savage in that regard? Mm -hmm. And has the Supreme Court managed to deal with that savage? And if you mm. become the CJ, mm. what do you have in mind in as far as uh, leading the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court in uh, dealing with this savage yes. for the good of the Kenyan women? You sound like a prosecutor. Um, um, uh, let me say that um, the uh, edict, and I call it an edict in the Constitution, on the two-thirds is a fiat. Uh, it is not something that is suggestive. It doesn't suggest that you might if you feel like it. Uh, the suggestion there 
uh, what that the suggestion I'm making is that uh, I would have dissented, I think, uh, uh, there with the majority uh, in that particular case, uh, because my sense is that um, to, uh, to, to, to take what is a clear constitutional fiat and put it in a basket of progressive realization, which is that the, the country might, at some point in the future when it feels like it, you know, treat women like equals, is a non-starter for me, is a non-sequitur. Um, I think that uh, sadly there, and uh, it, the majority got it wrong. Uh, my view is that, um, and I think there could be a problem, as AG has alluded uh, in, I think, uh, some things that he has written, that uh, someone could go to court and, you know, the whole thing could be declared, you know, null and void. Um, uh, so I think, I don't know what was guiding uh, the majority there. I've read the decision. I'm not persuaded at all uh, because they, they seem to conclude out of nowhere. They make assumptions about whether it can be done. You know, I don't know what kind of empirical evidence they had that it could not be done. It is like saying that we'll stop torture when we train our police. That's not how we deal with edicts, right? You, you stop it now, not, 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 not tomorrow. And if you commit an act like that, you, get, you, you become accountable. So I think as a, as, a, as a Chief Justice, what I would do basically, and this is why intellectual leadership is important, but also I would say, also I would say working with other arms of government, you know, I would persuade the other arms of government which are responsible for implementing uh, this principle, to become amicus curiae, you know, to give us their views. Not, not that, that they, I want a certain view, but just give us your views because you'll be responsible for implementing this thing. Give us your views about it uh, before, before the court so we can benefit from the wisdom of the court, I mean, of, 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 your, of your departments. So, so I, 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 I think that, but of course I'm mindful that this is just one person, the Chief Justice. Okay, and the others must be brought along. But I don't think that we can equivocate on an equal protection issue, on the basic issue of the rights of women, and claim to be implementing our constitution. We cannot do it. John? Going back to Sunni, your tenure. Yes. As dean. Yes. In the Buffalo News, Mm. of 8th May 2008. I believe that's uh, around the time you are ascending uh, as dean mm -hmm. of the institution. Um, I looked up the heading that said, expert on human rights is named UB Law Dean. Mm. And uh, there they state that uh, you had, you were quoted as saying that you wanted to dedicate yourself to bolstering the law school the law school stature and plans to build one of its own strengths, the faculty. Mm -hmm. That was in 2008. Mm. If you were to give yourself a score on your performance as dean mm. in that institution out of 10, mm. how much would you give yourself and why? Well, you, you don't want me to be vain, uh, so I will not be vain. Let me just say that um, um, uh, first, I, I was very honored uh, to be dean uh, of SUNY Buffalo Law School. Um, I was the first black dean of the institution. I was the first African to be dean of any law school in America. Uh, I consider that to be a singular achievement in my view. Uh, while I was dean, um, I led the law school uh, to its most, uh, uh, I think, um, transformative period. I hired 22 new faculty out of 56. Uh, I raised 20, $24 million in five years in a very difficult economic climate. 
Uh, the last campaign had lasted seven years and raised $12 million. Uh, I um, led the law school into the Order of the Quaif. Uh, you will know what the Order of the Quaif is. It's a very prestigious society. Um, uh, you know, I developed very close relationships with the bench and the bar, uh, uh, bringing town and gown together in a way that it had not been done by anybody. Uh, you know, I raised the LSAT scores. These are the scores of students entering students. Um, I raised bar pass rates for the students. Um, I, I, I raised the employment rates. So I would say that uh, I, I'd rather just let that sit there without giving myself a score. You don't want to give yourself a score. But no. there, there are some people who did give you a score. Yes. If I may refer to the same Buffalo News now, yes. this one is of September 27th, 2014. Yes. And the, the heading was Deep Rift Exposed as UB Law's Dean Resigns. Yes. And this is what they said. Mutua's seven years as dean appears to have divided the law school, pitting a man known across the world for human rights activism against uh, many of the school's most distinguishable faculty members. Mm. And one of the members faculty was uh, quoted as saying mm. about the situation as of the time you were leaving, mm. it's very toxic, it's very sad. Mm. Another one saying, we have a community that feels alienated by the administration and um, distance, distant from the school. And then another, yet another was saying that you had a unique management style of dividing and ruling, divide and rule, mm. where you prioritized pen penalizing your critics and rewarding your allies. Now that was the Buffalo News. They, mm. they must have, they didn't give you a score at the end of the day, but uh, <laughs> some people are <laughs> evaluating that. Now um, the reason I'm asking this mm. is as a follow-up to what um, Commissioner Uminde was saying that mm. in the second paragraph of, um, of your letter of application, mm. you did state th uh, that the Supreme Court faces several serious challenges mm. And you talked about uh, the need for a leadership, uh, for proper leadership mm. at the Supreme Court at this critical time. Yes. Now, when I look at that evaluation, of course, it's not scientific. Mm. It's from the media, but I mm. believe uh, it's a relatively well-rated uh, source. Mm. What then would we say about your ability to perform mm. and to give leadership mm. both at the Supreme Court and at the judiciary. And probably you could also mention why you had to resign as dean of the mm. institution. Yeah, so first of all, I, uh, thank you for the question. Um, let me say that um, uh, uh, governing a law school the professors will know about this. Uh, uh, law professors are like herding cats. Uh, try to <laughs> because they are individuals with tenure, they are their own, uh, they are independent. They don't have to listen to the dean at all. Uh, so the dean mu it must be a conciliator, must be a, um, a politician, uh, must not to massage egos. Uh, there is no dean that I know of, uh, of any law school, uh, and I'm sure including in Kenya, who doesn't have their critics. That just comes with territory. Uh, I just don't know any. Uh, if you go to uh, annual meetings uh, of deans in the United States, there are 200 law schools in the United States, you go there, these are some of the issues that deans discuss constantly. How do you pacify, deal with uh, dissident members of the faculty? It's always there. Uh, I had my, you know, I had th three or four people like that on my faculty. Um, you know, uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
I came to power in the law school at a time of great change in the United States. Just to contextualize what's going on. Uh, Barack Obama also became the president. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, there were some people among this group of three or four people on the faculty who uh, uh, saw my deanship through a, through a racial lens. Uh, and those are the people who are quoted in the article. Uh, you know, so I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't give much credence to, to that. Uh, you have letters from my president, who was president, who was provost and president when I was dean. And then you have a letter from, I think, the current dean, uh, Professor James Gardner, talking about my leadership style, you know, uh, uh, you know what I did for the law school. So my record stands uh, for itself. Um, you know, uh, I don't deny that, uh, that there was that group of people. I don't deny that. It's a fact. But, uh, you know, we, we had agendas to, 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 to accomplish. We were trying to raise LSATs. We were trying to teach black letter law courses. There were some people who were opposed to that. We were trying to get people to submit their grades in on time. They did not like that because the previous system was laissez faire. Okay? And part of my mandate as dean was to create a culture change in the law school, which I did. The, the person who is now dean was my vice dean. I appointed him as vice dean, Mr. James Gardner. Um, uh, I've said, I said earlier that, um, that I had been very fortunate to, uh, to have the career that I've had. Uh, I have accomplished, I have hit, to use your language, all the milestones in the academy. And I say that with some humility. I became a Sunni distinguished professor. I was the first Sunni distinguished professor in the law school. Um, I was, th you know, I was dean for seven years. Uh, any deanship that lasts fi over five years uh, uh, it's, uh, you don't want to be a dean beyond five years. Quite frankly, I stayed as dean mm -hmm. simply because the president asked me to stay. Uh, but after five years, I, 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 was, uh, I had accomplished my goals. I had raised the money, I had done all these things, uh, and I needed a break. I needed a break, and there was nothing for me left to accomplish. Um, so, so did you, have you just answered why you resigned? Is it because you needed a break? Yes. It had nothing to do with the perjury case? No, no, no. It not had at all. nothing to do? Not at all. I hope you will not want to resign after five years as no, it no, becomes no, actually, CG. I, no, I wanted, to leave, uh, I wanted to leave after five years because uh, the, life of, the life of a dean in the United States is 24-7. Uh, okay, I will take that. I will yeah. take the, the five yes. years. Just my final question. Yes. You have... Uh, alluded to the fact that uh, it would be important for judges, judicial officers to constantly get together uh, and uh, what you are saying in order to, uh, to, to foster collegiality uh, more constantly than they do on the once a year uh, colloquium. Mm. When it comes to issues of training and getting together to exchange ideas, how as a CJ would you balance between the training and mm. getting together mm. and the core function of judicial officers which is to hear and determine cases because that is a major issue at mm. least for the members of the law society and for the public at large how would you balance yes i i, I you know i i i want to believe that um um that we all want a thinking judiciary. You know, I want to believe that. Um, because uh, we are applying the law, and the law is a moving target, right? In terms of its legislation, it, there are always changes. There are always new decisions that come up. Um, our constitution, as they say, is a speaking constitution. 
So you have to think what I said yesterday perhaps is not what it might say tomorrow <laughs> because it's constantly speaking. Uh, I think that we need to think about that aspect of our judicial culture. To what extent are we making sure that we are uh, creating that culture of learning within the judiciary and balancing it, as you say, with the core function of judging? Although I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I don't think so. Um, but I think once a year is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. Uh, I think you can, e you can easily have 12 colloquia a year. 12, <coughs> once every month. It's not that everyone has to come there. But you can have, one every, you can have, you can have them where judges can discuss you know, emerging case law, where they can invite outsiders um, to interact with them, um, where they can interact with other arms of government, uh, where uh, law is the subject matter. You know, so I, 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 I'm, and I think also, let me just say this, um, <clears throat> I think there needs to be a, 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 a journal of law for judges, where judges can write, you know, things about law and jurisprudence that they want to write, just for judges. I will leave at it at that, uh, Professor, 12 colloquia per year. But uh, all the best. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Prof. Uh, invite Commissioner Wasame.